each of you raised such great points and we have uh, just an avalanche of questions uh, coming to us. But maybe we can begin, maybe we can begin with a question that some people have raised is, has Chinese rule been uniformly bad? Have there been any benefits for the people of Xinjiang, including Uyghurs, for uh, uh, being part of the People's Republic? Uh, economic investment, other opportunities throughout China, that sort of thing. This is a question that we often get. Is the story uniformly glum? Is the story just darkness? And that's for all three of you. I don't know, uh, you know, who would care to respond to that? As you all just stare back at me. I think Nornissa should uh, speak first on this. Okay, that's great. Go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, clearly, clearly the situation now is desperate. We're talking about the destruction of a culture, uh, the eradication of the distinctiveness of the Uyghur people. But have there been any benefits for Uyghurs being part of the People's Republic? Well, I, I tried to wrap my mind around it. it's a huge huge question, especially um, a person like me that grew up there, came to the United States, had a bit of, bit of taste of what would be like to live in China and, and here. So in, in regards to benefits, if you're referring to the recent economic development or uh, China uh, rise to be a superpower, in the world, then um, it, it depends who you ask. And if you ask me, my question would be no. Because I, as I mentioned earlier, um, the economic development opportunities were biased in so many ways. Um, for example, um, I, when, I, the, when I went back to Kashgar, and I saw that uh, the urbanization was taking place and right behind the ancient uh, Kashgar, uh, and you see high skyrocket buildings and modernization. And interestingly enough, that the Uyghurs were still living in that small uh, area. And um, the expansion of economies, you see more, uh, the, the Han Chinese population being benefited, for example. So, um, and it's it's heartbreaking, and because I that would be nice to have that equal opportunities for Uyghurs as well. Um, and personally, my the my dad was a an engineer in the in, uh, mm -hmm. water bureau. And I remember we had a, quite a few Uyghurs being employed when, as I, I saw them as I grew up. But when I went back, some of them retired, but I see a tremendous, most Han Chinese uh, employees in that area and just being modernized. Um, so I, I, I feel like the the damage that has been done in East Turkestan in, in many levels it is heartbreaking and it, it's I, I I'm not sure um, how long it would take to repair it and I guess as an educator I paid more attention to the uh, the dramatic change in education system um, such as eradicating the uh, bilingual education system that somehow I was able to benefit and, and be able to, you know, survive. And, but it, it was completely gone. And when, when I went back to Kashkar and a lot of my friends, and I don't want to 
put them on the spot, but just like them, they were, they ha didn't have any choice to, but putting their kids to Han Chinese schools because they were worried. They were worried that uh, people like me who were bilingual and had the same skills, they didn't see any future. They saw it, they witnessed it. So they were, they were okay, or basically, I have to say, forced to send their kids to Han Chinese schools that hoping that they would have the same opportunity as Han Chinese students. Um, so with my personal experience, and I just, I lost the, everything that I remembered. And so it's heart wrenching. Clearly, your evaluation is that uh, the new buildings are there, but that the Uyghur, uh, you know, the 45% or so of the population isn't benefiting at the same route, at the same rate, that uh, benefits are going disproportionately to others, to other members of other ethnic groups, and that there hasn't been a systematic effort uh, perhaps to address that. We know that on average, people in Xinjiang live shorter lives than people in more developed regions of China. We know that they have lower uh, household income. So we know those kinds of things. Uh, Drew, what would you, how would you respond to that? And then Elise, if you could uh, weigh in uh, as well. My point would be, it's very difficult to calculate uh, what the government has really done in the region. Um, you know, if you've been watching uh, uh, Governor Cuomo <laughs> recently with the his briefings on the coronavirus, he's been starting to spell out how much the federal government puts in to New York budget and how much New York puts into the federal budget. And he's talking about that New York beyond other states gives an incredible amount to the central budget. And the Chinese government's very good about reporting its investment in Xinjiang and its educational rise in education, rise in it acknowledges that mortality among Uyghurs is one of the highest and, and less education, et cetera. But it, it also- Drew, if I could interrupt for a second, you have the capacity to share a slide now yeah, if okay, you would like. I'll try. Uh, uh, but, but please just go ahead and continue because uh, yeah. it's clear. Well, this slide doesn't really answer that question, unfortunately, but it does suggest how critical um, this, uh, um, I don't know if you're, I can see that. Um, it's not, um, let's see. It's, yeah, there we go. It's fine, yeah. Uh, you got that? Okay, so basically China's really uh, reporting how much it's invested in this region, particularly in light of Xi Jinping's recent, fairly recent Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and so, and I think this is why it has placed so much emphasis on uh, securitization and surveillance and preventing any kind of disruption from the region um, like we saw in the early and mid 2000s. Uh, once Xi Jinping's development policy ramps up, then we begin to see that either the repression completely cracks, cracks down. Uh, I've written before about this kind of being internal colonialism model, something the Chinese don't like my suggesting, because uh, they regard themselves as anti-colonialist. Uh, but if you look internally at China, it follows the classic model uh, that was uh, sort of demonstrated by scholars around the world of taking raw resources from the frontiers and the colonized regions, processing them in the metropole, and then sending some back, but always, uh, you know, always taking out. Having these so, dual economies, one extractive, one and extractive, then right? Using so China it as a market. has never reported what it's put back into the region, uh, and, and and really doesn't really report what it takes out either in terms of mineral resources. We know there's uranium, a plutonium. It does its nuclear testing. There was a recent test in the region again, um, and so this is a difficult. Uh, issue because if China were to report that, my suspicion is that over the years it's taken out much more than it's put back in. It has put in a lot in terms of infrastructure. Those of us who have been going to the region for 30 years, uh, it's been remarkable how much more developed it is. 
And you can look across the border <coughs> at Tajikistan, at uh, Jammu uh, Kashmir in northern Pakistan, uh, and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and you can really see a major difference uh, that does show that uh, Xinjiang has benefited from a lot of this enormous investment and stands to benefit if this Belt and Road Initiative uh, goes forward and succeeds. So there's a lot at stake here. But I think the important point in this slide is to suggest that it's still a border area and the Chinese character for the Jiang of Xinjiang, uh, which means frontier, also shows in and of itself this kind of militaristic uh, you know, emblem of the gong of the sword and, the, uh, uh, and also the two fields separated by three mountain range. I think it's a lovely character. But I think you yourself, uh, Clay, pointed out that it really wasn't until the 1880s that this region received the official name Xinjiang. Prior to that, it was Western regions, it was frontier, uh, local names, oasis names, etc. So it's only been under this expansion of the Chinese state that the region has been very recently brought into China. And that's why it's called in Chinese New Region. They've even talked about changing that name. Um, so I think it's important to realize that this is an area that is, Owen Lamar said, was a pivot of Asia. It's also the pivot to the success of the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's what's key. To, I think that's driving uh, this shift in ethnic and religious policy uh, and the securitization of the region. Yeah, and you know, you've just you've just highlighted again. Uh, this is very high stakes, uh, very high stakes for the for the state, and a lot of the infrastructure, the high speed rail, expanded airports, all of these kinds of things are also in addition to facilitating economic development. There are also instruments of control, the control of movement, the ability to move uh, troops and others about. Elise, what would you like to say? Hey, yeah, I have, um, I mean, I have to admit when you first posed your question, I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go on the record one way or the other, right? <laughs> are there benefits for Uyghurs being part, uh, in being part of the People's Republic of China? Um, I'll share a few, I'll share two anecdotes quickly. So one was in 2013, I was in Kashgar. I had last been in Kashgar in 2007. There had been massive changes. Um, suddenly there were a bunch of new high, high rise buildings. There was a larger Han presence between 2007 and 13. Uh, and I went to chat with instrument makers, um, which I often did when I was in the South on research trips. And I, I said, you know, so tell me about Tell me about this development. Tell me about you know what's happened in Kashgar and and how do you see it? And they said, you know, I, I, I in a particular moment when I was speaking with several at once, they said, you know, I, we actually think this this is good. It's great. Like in some ways, right? We could be poised to benefit from this. The problem is that we we are not seeing what the benefits are of this, right? People are being lured here with high salaries, with housing incentives. And yeah, this is great. Kashgar is differently sparkling and shining and modern, but where and how do we benefit from it? And uh, several months later, after hearing a really moving song at a concert that I went to with a friend, that friend said to me, you know, this is the second anecdote. She said, you know, there are a lot of ways in which my, my life is really materially good. You know, the, the standard of living has improved here. We were in Urumqi, not in Kashgar. The standard of living has improved here. I have nice clothes, a nice apartment to live in, food to eat. It's great. But I would really like to be treated equally. I would really like not to be a second class citizen. And I think there's so much that hinges around that. We cannot forget the institutionalized racism. We cannot forget that increasingly, especially from 2014 onward, China began pursuing a lot of policies that, that really look a whole lot like apartheid. Mm -hmm. Uyghurs were very much living in an apartheid sort of context. Um, and you know, people want to live lives of, of dignity. And so you can tout the GDP all you want. And yeah, people have 
an improved standard of living materially, maybe, not even everyone equally, but yeah, are they living lives of dignity is the question. Well, and that's, that's such a, a valid point, this question of apartheid. Uh, so it's not just being Uyghur in Xinjiang where you're subject to uh, extra surveillance and discrimination and not given the same access to certain opportunities. Try to leave, try to go somewhere else and work or just to travel. And of course, the fact that you are Uyghur uh, subjects you to certain discrimination. We have uh, countless stories of people who are not able to stay in hotels, uh, you know, and other kinds of problems. And so maybe you could say, the three of you could say something about uh, being Uyghur, but not in Xinjiang, you know, being, trying to access China. And everybody's being polite again. <laughs> May, and, want, and perhaps we should reverse this up and and Elisa uh, we'll we'll put you on the hook first okay well um yeah there are many accounts that Uyghurs have um and that I've heard firsthand from people and in secondhand and you know farther removed of, of Uyghurs when they travel elsewhere in China being denied hotel rooms mm -hmm. um simply because they are Uyghur and Uyghur is written on their ID cards in Chinese way war it says um, and so instantly right this is not pe people are guessing they're Uyghur maybe like it's it's actually written on their ID cards and so they're they're just turned away right at a hotel um, police and the, and the logic and the logic of that discrimination is what I mean the logic of the discrimination I, I think is I mean it's illogical but what is the justification well, right. Well, if you think that Uyghurs are all terrorists or would be terrorists already, then you're, you're going to think that people are dangerous, yeah. right? Uyghurs are treated in a way that is um, systemically, you know, very similar to how a lot of a lot of ethnic minority groups in, in different contexts around the world are treated with great suspicion as though they're all already thieves or criminals or, you know, something else. And there were there was even an internal something basically akin to an internal passport that was created that Weavers had to get back in 2014. And that was, I was living in the region at the time. That was one of the signs that something very awful was afoot, although we didn't know exactly what it was. So Weavers' ability to move around even within their home region was severely curtailed, again, because there was just this automatic set of associations, you know, terrorist, would-be terrorist, criminal, and so forth. And thank, thank you. And Nernisa, you told us about the suspicion uh, that the Chinese consulate had towards you simply because of your heritage, your ethnicity. And so uh, even with your U.S. passport, you were treated differently. Yes. I, I, I was, while I was listening to Elise, and I was remembering some, my experiences back home when finally I was able to get my visa and, and pass the custom when, when I landed at Guangzhou. Um, yeah, it is very mind boggling. Every time when I went to Chinese consulate, and I would have my passport and I would fill up the, the form. And uh, when it's my turn and they would ask me questions in English. And then when there's a, a, a blank says where your birthplace. And obviously I had to write Chinese uh, in China and then whole attitude of the person that was helping me would change. Um, then they said, well, you have to come back again, or you have to bring a birth certificate of your father, or your employment verification, um, uh, things like that. And I would observe people next to me uh, with the same passport. Well, they would they didn't have to come to Chinese consulate. You can go through you know a traveling agency, but for me, I have to be in, present in person, and then. I wouldn't get any information back from them. 
um, in the beginning when I went there first, it was, we'll get back to you. But the, in the second round or uh, the later on, they would tell me, they will tell me directly that we, we were going to contact the uh, officials back in Urumqi or Kashgar. And we have to make sure that we, when once we get the confirmation, we'll let you know. So that would be the back and forth communication with them. Um, and even after I landed Guangzhou, when we passed the, the costume, that would be very nerve wracking process for me too. Um, I remember clearly that was in the morning, 5 a.m. and my daughters and we were trying to pass and we passed the, uh, the security and then there was a certain code in Chinese because I, I could kind of understand what they were talking about. And we had to, we were asked to go back and they had to open our suitcase. It, we had to wait there for a while. And, and then whole mode of me um, just completely changed. My kids were scared um, and um, things like that. And then I, when I went back there and I had to report to the police, and register where I was uh, staying. Um, uh, and also just, I was told to carry my passport wherever I go. And me being, uh, having that US passport created such a discomfort between myself and uh, people that who I interacted with. And they were very careful what to say. Um, and, uh, and I was very careful because I understood that I, I was just, my plan was to go back and see my family, enjoy food and uh, whatever came to me. Um, but I observed, I, ob I couldn't help but noticing the, the dramatic change. And um, in regards to uh, what Alice said, yes, there is materialistically, I, I have seen some improvement, but in regards to the leverage of freedom, it was getting worse and worse every year. Uh, the narrowing and every time I went back, yes. The narrowing of space and and your experience as a Uyghur American returning, uh, you know, is uh, is obviously quite distinctive. But even somebody like Drew, who is not a Uyghur American, but is an American who studies Uyghurs among other Muslims, uh, you have been treated differently as well. Yeah, I mean, in the, my early period of research. Um, you know, uh, I was often mistaken as a Uyghur. I know Elise certainly has had this issue come up quite a bit. Uh, once I was arrested for supposedly impersonating a Uyghur, I wasn't. They just assumed I was. Um, because a Westerner in that area, speaking some Uyghur or Mandarin, uh, you know, was quite unusual. Now it's not so unusual. However, I haven't been back to the region since 2004 when I was part of this blacklisting. Um, so I don't really don't know, uh, except through travelers reports and colleagues who have written very, very incisively uh, on their trips back to the region. But clearly it's not the same kind of access that we used to have, particularly since the 2009 riots been strictly curtailed. Um, so I really think on this issue that the government is stuck uh, on two horns of this dilemma the dilemma of the Minzu policy on which the People's Republic of China was founded, 56 nationalities with autonomous regions like Xinjiang, like Tibet, and others in the South, in Yunnan, which often are doing pretty good under this policy. Uh, Nashi groups, the Yi, um, even in Inner Mongolia, they haven't had as many of these kinds of problems, although there are significant issues and complaints. Uh, the other side is this desire for modernization and sinicization, which in the past, they basically suggested you did not have to become Han to be Chinese. Under Xi Jinping, most of us now feel they've reversed that, and it's really Hanification. Uh, it's sinicization and assimilationist policy. Basically, the idea they tried this multinational, multi-ethnic state didn't work. And so now we're gonna push populism, Han nationalism, and if you don't get with the program, you're not part of the uh, patriotic 
supporters of the state. So Uyghurs in the past could be patriotic, but also affirm their cultural and religious heritage. Now they are being forced to choose. And this goes against the government's laws, their policy. So people like Marong want to change the laws. But I don't think it's going to be as easy to dismantle this huge apparatus uh, as it was, say, in Vietnam, where they had a policy uh, mirrored on China, which is based on the former Soviet Union of these multinational state. So nationalities. And so where are they going to go with this? Um, it's very difficult. Uh, most scholars have argued that this autonomous system has not worked. The minority areas are far poorer, far behind the Han. And yet many of us feel that there are some examples where it has worked. And to dismantle it may take away the very, very few privileges that the minorities actually have enjoyed in the past that have been substantial, uh, but yet I think now today have really begun to isolate them and hold them back um, and, and keep them from really participating in China's programs of development, which are often very exclusivizing now towards minorities, unless they completely sell out and give up their, their ethnic identity. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for responding to you know, these, these difficult questions. Uh, now they're going to get even more difficult. Uh, and uh, we have quite a few folks in the Q&A section. And I would encourage, uh, even if you don't want to ask a question, to encourage people to look and scroll through the questions. And some, some contributors, uh, scholars from Cornell and elsewhere, have been posting uh, reading suggestions and other resources and things like that. So do take advantage of that and we'll share those resources on the web page when this thing is placed on our website. But uh, let's look at this broader geopolitical context. And uh, Drew has made mention of it, uh, Nernisa has made mention of it uh, with regard to China at the UN, but also the mobilization of uh, critics and the mobilization of people, of, of states that are supportive, at least the state at the state level of Beijing. Drew made the point that there's a gap between uh, the state in some of these cases and the street, that people are disgusted and upset and want action, but their governments are choosing to go uh, with the deep pockets of, of Beijing, the, the promise of investment. And so I'd like to ask this geopolitical question is, where, where is this, how does this play internationally? How does this play at the internet in, in terms of international organizations? And then within the United States, we, you know, all of you are experts and have spoken uh, at local and national levels to politicians, to different groups. Who's responding? Who is it? What's your take on this? And uh, again, I'm gonna leave it, leave it to whoever would like to go first. Uh, maybe, uh, Nernisa, if we could focus on the work that you've done trying to mobilize uh, local congressional uh, representatives, but also you know, moving to DC as well. Uh, I I don't know if uh, we've lost Nernisa. Are you able to hear? Yeah, I'm here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'm here. Which audiences have been most responsive, most supportive? Uh, and you know, we we had Drew offered some uh, some questions about the alignment of the political parties and things like that. But who is listening? Who is acting? So when <clears throat> I have to go back to 2017, when 
this whole atrocities started to unfold. Um, I have the to say- The latest atrocities. Latest atrocities, yes, thank you. Latest atrocities. I feel like <clears throat> we got uh, at least a, a strong condemnation from US government. Um, for example, the, the, the bill that was introduced by Marco Rubio and Chris Smith and Brad Sherman, um, it uh, ha allowed us to, uh, to kind of expand our horizon to reach out to people, like not only politicians, but you know, uh, the organizations, um, things like that. Um, and then obviously European countries also, uh, they strongly condemned the, uh, the Chinese government. But my frustration is, is that I, we haven't, I personally, I haven't seen the, a, a significant tangible measures against, you know, the, the Chinese human rights uh, abuses. And that's, for me, it's kind of slow response, even though we get so many noise, uh, so much noise from our international communities. Um, so I'm still kind of learning along. It's a kind of new path for me. And, and personally, I'm in it. I'm one of them that was screaming for help. And uh, the, every step that we're, uh, the, the international community is taking is too slow for me, too slow for me. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we, we do have enough evidence and we did have enough to present to the world that this is happening and we're screaming. Um, so I'm, I'm learning, I'm listening to uh, everyone really and just help me find a solution and how can we make sure that we put the stop on it. And, um, and also I understand that uh, Chinese role in geopolitical uh, platform and there's so much uh, at stake for so many countries, especially Muslim countries, that they actually condoned, uh, you know, Chinese government's uh, behavior. Um, and so in personal level and my knowledge and my understanding is so limited and I'm just waiting for the solution. I'm, I'm just waiting for people to, to come together and uh, find a specific uh, ways to uh, solve this problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, how people respond to evidence, to, uh, you know, the, the very powerful narrative that you and others offer is quite, is quite striking. And uh, I don't know, Drew or Elise, uh, you're on the front lines as well. I, yeah, I can jump in as someone, I, I live and work in Washington, D.C. I briefly, you know, was at the Congressional Executive Commission on China Federal Commission last summer. Um, to the questions of who is listening and who, enacti who is acting, actually a lot, of, a lot of people are listening and a lot of um, different segments of the U.S. government are listening. I know there's a lot of criticism of government involvement in one way or another, and some of it very well placed, but you, if you're going to engage with China, you kind of do have to engage on that government level. Mm -hmm. Who is the government going to listen to other governments and, you know, multilateral bodies and so forth. And but you know, a lot if, of- At least if I, if I can interrupt, maybe you could say something about uh, the application of sanctions on individuals, mm -hmm. uh, adding companies to the entity list. Yeah. Does that I mean, matter? Does it work? It, it, it has, been, you know, so when the U.S. government put a number of companies, I believe 28, on this entities list last year, you know, a lot of people were very excited about this. But U.S. individuals and U.S.-based companies continue to do business with them with no repercussions. And a lot of people are very pro-Magnitsky sanctions, but Mnuchin um, has, is dragging his feet to actually... So you know, Secretary of the Treasury. Right. Yeah. So... Um, you know, government is, of course, complex, the feature of bureaucracies everywhere. Um, a lot of different people who make up the government are, are listening and, interest, and interested, but there's, there's a whole lot more talk than there is action. And I think the reasons for that are, are complex and also really disappointing when you actually want to see action moving forward. 
Yeah, well, getting, just that, getting action. Please, Drew. Yeah, just that um, prior to the pandemic, I think many of us were surprised at how much coverage uh, was being given to the Uyghur issues. Um, and from both sides of the spectrum, uh, both sides of the aisle, and uh, issues like this, Sunday New York Times Magazine, you know, cover, front page articles, foreign policy, uh, a lot of um, uh, you know, excellent coverage despite the, the limitations placed on reporting in the region. Uh, once a pandemic hit, of course, uh, the tension has shifted dramatically. But now that we're moving into the electoral period um, and the, uh, the primaries, both sides are going to engage in a great deal of China bashing. And clearly the Xinjiang issue uh, will be in the forefront uh, and a very uh, heavy club by which to beat China over the head. And as a scholar, I am somewhat conflicted by that because as you can tell from my presentation, I'm very critical of the government policy, but I hate, would hate to see the Uyghurs being again uh, used as a pawn in these larger you know, machinations. And once they've accomplished what they want to do in whichever party wins, then they're shoved to the side again. Uh, what we need is really a sustained dialogue, three-way or five-way, maybe five, be like, like North Korea was addressed at one point, five sides, five parties. Uh, there are many, many stakeholders in this region. As I concluded my talk, the Uyghurs have never had a seat at the table, unlike Tibetans. Uh, and people need to think outside the box. I don't think Magnitsky sanctions are going to be particularly effective, mainly because Chinese oligarchs <laughs> hide their money better. And we're dealing with state corporations and government policy, uh, not individuals so much. Certainly there are individuals that could be held accountable. Um, but we do know that there's substantial criticism within China against Xi Jinping's policy in this region, and there have been significant failings over the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so all of these aspects affect the Xinjiang problem and the Uyghurs. And I really think that now is an opportunity to educate ourselves and the public on this very complicated issue and why Xinjiang does matter to all of these issues and this incredibly important region. Um, and, and again, I think this kind of event uh, is, is, is really, really important uh, to uh, keep the conversation going uh, and not to uh, shut down uh, opportunities for Uyghurs to speak, especially, uh, but also to hear the Chinese side a little more effectively. You know, there's been a lot of writing, uh, Tom, Thomas Han and others on Han Chinese uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, and a lot of Chinese Han have written on this issue quite perceptibly. Uh, and they have a lot to say, many of them third generation, um, about this region. Some of them are considered Xinjiang, -ren, Xinjiang person. So I really think that we could have a much uh, more informed uh, conversation on this if we don't take sort of bipartisan sides and jump on every bandwagon. Uh, and I, I really am concerned about myself, uh, where, where to, where, how to best be most effective uh, in trying to give voice to some of our colleagues who cannot speak out, uh, but also try to improve my own understanding of what's actually uh, going on in the region. No, th thank you. And we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but Elise, no, don't worry. Elise has her, has, is, is waving and we'll go to Elise. But I think that one of the things that I'm hearing is, you know, we're talking about millions of people when we're talking about the Uyghurs, when we're talking about the region, we're talking 24 million residents. And not wanting it to just be a convenient political cudgel used as part of an election campaign to curry favor with a particular audience. 
but to stand with the region, to stand with the people, and to address the kinds of concerns that were raised, perhaps through dialogue. At least you've been very patient, please. Hey, I was just gonna say, so, you know, um, Drew I think, rightly mentioned that the attention, our attention shifted with coronavirus, COVID-19, this, you know, global pandemic we're all living through that has confined us all to our homes, right, as we give this presentation. Um, but I, th I think it's important for us not to forget that that is very much connected to this set of issues in ways we might not realize. So one thing, for those of you who are interested in resources you can look at to teach and to better understand the situation, Vice recently put out a great article in which they discussed um, the Chinese company BYD, which means build your dreams, uh, and is, is actually blacklisted by the Trump administration, but has recently contracted with the state of California to sell masks, a, a Chinese version of N95 masks at about $3.30 per mask, I believe, right, to the state of California. And it's, there's a lot of suggestive evidence that Uyghurs working in conditions of forced labor made those masks, right? So we're looking at these issues are not decoupled from one another, right? And I, I have some suspicions partly because I, partly because of my connections and the closeness to this set of issues, but I think we're going to see more really important and valuable reporting coming out, showing us how these issues are linked and calling into question, right? Some of the moves that we're making as we all try to figure out how to address this pandemic, but the other issues that existed before it as well. Uh, the, uh, as it happens, BYD's North American headquarters is about two miles up the street uh, from USC. Uh, so we're, we're familiar with, uh, with the company. But also, it's been highlighted, uh, the wonderful reporting that has been done. Uh, Gary Schur, first with the Associated Press, now with the Washington Post, uh, Josh Chin and others working for the Wall Street Journal. Of course, uh, the tremendous work done by the New York Times, Chris Buckley and others, uh, but also you know, this international consortium that has helped to bring these documents into public discussion. This has been really vital, absolutely, absolutely critical. But I'd like to end, uh, well, we'll end, each of you gets 30 seconds to say what you will. But before that, uh, to pick up on this question of audiences within China. Now, because of censorship and other you know, uh, constraints, right? I mean, the, 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 there are a lot of reasons why a lot more people perhaps in China are not talking about Xinjiang issues. But I'm curious what the three of you think about ethnic Chinese responses to these revelations that people have been denied their liberty, not for anything they've done, not even necessarily for anything they've said, but for who they are. How are ethnic Chinese that you have contact with here, there, responding? And Drew, we're gonna we're, we'll start with you, and go the go then to Nernisa and then Elise. Uh, we need to get your mic on. Yeah, I think I'm I'm muting here. Um, well, um, you know, I think we're also experiencing because of this COVID nineteen situation a lot of anti-Asian American sentiment, um, you know, Asians mistaken for Chinese and blamed for this thing, or being oh. infectious, uh, where I can't get my, the host can do that. The host uh, can, oh, what, uh, uh, rather than trying to show a slide, just go ahead and tell us. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to slide. Uh, it's just that I think that, um, in a crisis, people look for scapegoats. Uh, they fall into their stereotypes. 
Uh, in China, I think particularly, as I mentioned, since the riots of 2009, Uyghurs uh, were thought to be um, you know, violent and uh, radicalized. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of sympathy in China. I've not been able to go back to Xinjiang, but I've actually made a few trips to Southern China uh, to actually do some research on my father's work as a flying tiger in World War II. You know, history is a little safer than the present. Uh, and I've been concerned not to interact with Uyghurs in China because I did not want to put them in any danger. Um, so I did, though, talk to a lot of my Chinese and Han colleagues uh, about the situation in North Northwest China, Xinjiang. And many of them were privately very critical of the government's policy. Um, and have a much more nuanced perspective. But of course, uh, it's very difficult for them to express that publicly. Um, and the government is not only, you know, clamped down on any uh, academic literature regarding the COVID-19 situation, but has learned to contain uh, scholarly and, and public opinion uh, and shape it very effectively through social media. So I think it really takes uh, very good in-depth reporting to get at uh, popular Chinese sentiment on this very uh, contentious issue. Um, and I, you know, I think you, when you meet with Chinese who've traveled to the region, they've often traveled in a bubble and they haven't really been able to uh, get to the bottom of things either. So we really need a multi ord much more nuanced perspective before we can draw to any, any really clear conclusions on what's the best way forward. Right, and we've seen now tourism to both Xinjiang and Tibet, predominantly from China internally, and external folks not being able to go, and then you're part of a package and, and limited in that way. Nernisa, what, what do you think? Well, I, <clears throat> I understand if, Somehow, I understand if there's a, a discrepancy or miscommunication or lack of information in, in, inside of China, because that's how the Chinese government operates. Um, for example, um, the only social media app that I was able to communicate before 2017 was just one, mm -hmm. uh, WeChat, and it's highly scrutinized by Chinese government. And you can tell that how much uh, the the public view uh, is being uh, under surveillance or scrutinized by Chinese government. So, and then also they control all media and what to, you know, release to public. So <clears throat> that, <coughs> excuse me, I, I understand low, I mean, I can relate, but in the United States or in the other part of the world, my source of information is the same as everyone else right here. And I got the same information and we were able to bring the community together. And with that hard you know, evidence, with that testimonies, heartbreaking testimonies of camp survivor, survivors such as Mihrigul and Sairigul, um, then because I'm one of them, and my reaction is very different. It's very personal and I'm screaming for help. And people from the outside of China, um, and that's what we do. We, we get the information, we process it, and we put our moral campus to analyze it, what it is and what needs to be done. So what kind of actions and what side you're on. And in that case, I don't really comprehend our, um, the population here who are who came from mainland China and I'm open to a dialogue and I don't remember any of the uh, students and Chinese students who came from China to reach out to me or any of my friends for uh, a conversation or um, you know having that dialogue or kind of uh, empathy uh, toward us and our cause um, maybe they were afraid uh, because they wanted to go back. I don't know what their rationale is, but that, that is a huge gap in my opinion 
um, that uh, needs to be addressed. So I, I'm, I get to learn more about the rationale, why there's not much communication with the uh, or voice from mainland China for uh, standing with us or condoning Chinese policies. Um, so I get to learn more about it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Elise, and, and then we'll come back and each of you, uh, if you would, in your last comments, the 30 seconds that we allocate, if you could say whatever it is you want to say, uh, perhaps you might want to make a concluding statement at what's at stake in Xinjiang. But uh, first, at least what, what, are, uh, what responses have you noticed from ethnic Chinese? I mean, I've noticed a range, and I and in in that way, I'm I'm not going to say anything that's significantly different from what either uh, Drew or Nornisa has said. Um, it's really easy. This is in this, the way that some of us portray this sometimes to think like no one knows about this and no one cares and no Chinese people care because China doesn't have a free press. And yeah, there are a lot of problems, right, that make the lack of an independent free press and the problems with civil society, the complications of civil society in China, you know, make um, intergroup solidarity difficult, a little different. Um, even in our supposedly, you know, more open environment in the US, we still have problems with that, right? Um, and you can find a range and a spectrum. And I've, I've been heartened at you know, presentations I've given on college campuses um, to be approached by ethnic Chinese students, including students from mainland China, saying things like, you know, I had no idea about this. What can I do? Right? So I think it's important that we don't forget that that, that does happen and that does exist. Uh, we, friends, we're up against a hard Zoom deadline. <laughs> and so I gave you 30 seconds. Now I can only give you 10 seconds. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna thank everybody who has joined us. In case we lose you in the next minute, uh, we're glad you joined us. Please do share a link to the website, to the YouTube channel video of today's event. Let other people get what you have gotten from this experience. And so uh, please, let's, let's begin. Uh, Nernisa, Elise, and then Drew, what's at stake in Xinjiang? Well, <clears throat> everything really is at the stake in Xinjiang. People's livelihood, uh, people's future. Um, so you name it. And um, the presentation, the information that you got from Elise, Drew, and myself, they're facts. They're facts. And, um, and for me, they're not just numbers and statistics. Um, it's, it's real. And my life is real. What I'm going through, or and and other Uyghurs are going through, they're real, and they're they're waiting for the international community to come and bring justice for their uh, suffering, and including myself. So um, there's. I also realize that they're not small, a big part that you can play. So anything that you can do. Um, that would be a huge, huge help for us. So I want to say thank you for everyone for being here. So you being here, it, it means a lot. It speaks volumes. And yeah. I'm here. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to me, you have my contact information. I'll be glad to answer more questions. Yeah, we, it, it's such a treasure having uh, the three of you with us. Uh, please, who's next? I am. Uh, Go ahead, Elise. Okay. It's the same for me as well. I got some great questions, which I jotted down. Would love to talk to some of you about some of you I know, <laughs> some of you I don't. Um, so we can get in touch and, and I'd be happy to, to have a discussion about the questions you raised. Um, what's at stake? I, are, I already mentioned this. I'll just sum it up by saying the right to live dignified lives. That's what's at stake. Well said. Well said. Drew? You started us. Yeah, I think uh, everything's at stake. The 21st century. Uh, really, we're at a, a, a moment of going forward or backwards, uh, going forward with globalization, with 
uh, international cooperation to solve these issues, or we're going to go back into a period of nationalism and populism uh, and walls and borders. Uh, I think it's clear which side I'd like to move forward on. Uh, I think it's wrong to ask the question, like uh, my friend Kishore Mababani's new book, Has China Won? I don't think it's a zero stakes game. Uh, I think it's the human race at stake here. Uh, and treatment of the Uyghurs, who are at the middle of this juxtaposition between Asia and Europe, in Eurasia, at the heart of Asia, I think it's the treatment of the Uyghurs is a critical moment uh, for people to think about what do we really want our future to look like? And I think everything's at stake. Uh, and in order, if we don't cooperate, if we don't resolve basic issues of human rights, the right to health, the right to prosperity, and the pursuit of happiness, happiness and freedom, then I, I don't know uh, what, you know, where we're going to go if we don't really raise those uh, most serious of questions in this most critical of regions. Thank you for hosting this event. Now, thanks, thanks to all of you. Uh, you're clearly all right. Everything is at stake. Uh, not just for the people of Xinjiang, although that's of paramount importance. This speaks to who all of us are. Do we care? What matters? What priorities do we have? And thanks to our panelists, but thanks too to the hundreds of people who joined in, who gave up one, one person in the Q&A section said, it's really pretty outside, but I'm glad I'm here. Uh, and I think that everyone who gave up this chunk of their Saturday has been richly rewarded. These are vital issues. And so each of you, if you could share a link to these presentations uh, at our website, at our YouTube channel, and we will continue this work. Uh, again, heartfelt thanks. I can't wait to be able to hand this mug to each of you in person. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone. Take care. Everything's at stake in Xinjiang.